We've learned that the single most powerful way to get a group of highly talented people to be effective is to give them the right information in the right form at the right time. So I want you to be thinking, what's the information that you need? But I also, more importantly, I want you to be thinking about the information that the administrators, that the teachers, that the teams that you're working with need. And one of the big strategies that we use within PBIS is not trying to do things for people, but to actually build capacity to put it in place. The last big part of putting all this together is within the way that we do implementation of PBIS, essentially, we should always become irrelevant within 18 months. If you ever work with a consultant who doesn't become irrelevant within 18 months, you've got a problem. That means you don't just do training, you've actually got to build training, coaching, performance capability. So those are the things that I see as being the goals for today. Now, uh, I'm a professor of special education at the University of Oregon. Um, I actually was a, a teacher in a separate school in Palo Alto many, many years ago. Um, and most of the work that I have done, I was trained as a behavior analyst, and most of the early work that we did was really focused on how do you build um, effective, high-intensity interventions for those kids who have the most significant problem behaviors. Um, kids with significant disabilities, kids with mental health problems, kids who are engaging in the violence. I mean, part of what you all, you all are the safety valves for schools in San Francisco. These are the kids that you encounter. So most of my early work was around uh, the theory, the technology, the implementation strategies for doing high intensity interventions. I sat on the NIH study section that looked at the most current genetics, the neuroscience, the education, the mental health pieces. And I know right now everyone loves, you know, one of the key things that you're supposed to do in workshops is bring everything back to brain-based stuff. Basically, I've, I've sat with the neurologist and there's still a lot we've got to learn, right? A lot of that is a little bit over, oversold. So be a little bit careful. Uh, we've still got a lot of um, room for humility around those interventions. But part of what I can say is right now, we know more about how to provide high intensity wraparound supports for kids with intense problem behaviors than ever before in the history of you know, the, the field. So there's, there's great hope. The problem is it's really expensive. And anybody who thinks that's the solution is not counting. There are more of them than there are of us, okay? So part of what I want you to be thinking, you are gonna be the people where somebody comes in and says, Elliot basically is making this an unsafe environment and we want you to change his carburetor or whatever you psychologists do, but get him to start behaving well, right? And then, and um, when I, was in, when I was in Palo Alto, the number of times that I was in meetings, we had these meetings where we would say, you know, Corky is somebody we really like. I mean, she has great strengths. She's really a student uh, that we value. Now, she has some behaviors that are a challenge, but we, we have great compassion for her. And we want to find a place for her that is really appropriate for her, just preferably very far from us. <laughs> Right? You've been in those? The field is changing. It's changing really fast. Uh, the role of school psychologists is changing. The role of special services is changing. The expectations for education is changing. You can see in the, the federal regs, the things that are coming down, those of you who are looking at the LCAPs, I mean, um, I met with Gordon Jackson, who's the assistant superintendent of instruction for the state of California. And part of, part of what's happening is we're really coming to understand that this segmented way that we have looked at kids and families doesn't work. We've got to build much more coherent and much more cohesive ways of providing support. So here's essentially what we've learned. One, we can do functional behavioral assessment tied with good mental health supports to do high intensity interventions. That is not going to get us the solution that we need. PBIS is all about doing interventions with a whole school system. And that's really where the tiered approach is coming in. 
So part of what I want you to take away, when you look at those triangles, I'm going to ask you today to take a little bit of time and say, in schools you know, how well are we doing with Tier 1? How well are we doing with Tier 2? And what are some of the challenges you're being asked to solve with Tier 3? You are in the role that we typically were in over and over again, where we're being asked to use high-intensity interventions to deal with kids who are out of control because we have failed to build the foundation of an effective education system. Okay? PBIS is a whole school effort. It's for all kids. And um, part of what makes it a little bit confusing is we're actually putting kids with disabilities in the group with all kids. All right? And it is one of the other things, we don't want a conceptual model for academic RTI and another one for behavioral RTI. We want one conceptual model that says you build a foundation that's going to work with at least 80% of the kids. You're going to have high intensity supports. One of the things that I would challenge is I want you to be uh, thinking especially about tier two because in the experience that I've had, most people get the idea of tier one but tier two is the place where things really fall down. So some of the others of you have been doing this for You know a while. how to do functional behavioral assessment. You know how to do academic assessments. Basically, one of the messages from all of the behavioral intervention systems is unless you measure the impact of what you're doing, you will not get it in place with fidelity, and you certainly won't get it in place in a way that sustains. So I want you to put PBIS in place with a level of fidelity that it lasts for how long? Ten years. All right? I mean, that, that actually is not a myth. We actually measure that. I can tell you that if you implement PBIS to criterion, to Prineville level criteria, you will have an 85% conditional probability of sustaining fidelity implementation for five years. All right? So we actually have published those numbers. And if you don't measure fidelity, Everybody learns the words, the posters, and the tokens, okay? And, um, and the, the thing that we keep missing, the goal is not to implement PBIS. The mechanism is implementing PBIS. The goal is to improve the effectiveness of the school as an equitable and efficient learning environment. That's the goal. And so we keep coming back to the goal. And your schools, all of your schools need to be looking at the extent to which they are um, establishing a social culture. That's an effective learning environment now. I mean, one of the LCAP requirements, whether they're doing it or not, at least the State Department is very proud of having made that, uh, that event. Okay, if you were to speak to a school board, to administrators, to the parent group, or to a teacher in the hallway, right? Can you say, what is PBIS and why should you be really excited about doing it? We can walk in and talk to a faculty and say, we're going to build Tier 1 PBIS. And what they're saying is, Emmett is bleeding us dry right now, right? Don't tell me about Tier 1. All right, so in that regard, so the, you're really getting down into more of the nitty gritty the, the short answer to that is you must provide relief from pain before you ask somebody to build something new. If someone is in pain, you must remove the pain. And in most mm. cases, what that's going to mean is you're going to use a traditional, expensive strategy to deal with Emmett. Okay? You're going you're to do something that is not sustainable, but it will work. But the reason that you'll do it that's different and the reason that you'll get Thomas to pay for it is because, <laughs> is because you attach it. No, listen. You attach it to Tier 1 supports. What you say is, we'll help you with Emmett, but only if you invest in building the foundation that will make it work. What everybody really will buy is they'll say, deal with Emmett. Look, if I don't have Emmett, then you know, I'm cool. I've got to do this other stuff. If you don't do the both parts, then you don't, you don't get, all right? Exactly. The other, the other piece is everybody looks at Emmett as being the challenge. Emmett basically is the outcome. Emmett is the outcome of the community and the social context that you've, that you've created. 
So it's not just that this is a challenge for us right now. I want you to worry about the fact that we're creating the next Emmett, the next Emily, right? We're creating the next people at the same time. So when you build that back in, it is, it is a, a model that is heavily based on investment. So if there's anything about the triangle that I really want you to take away, I want you to take away the big focus on investing in prevention. We've got to do a better job of being very articulate about these are specifically what you do, this is what it costs, and quite frankly, in this era, we've got to be really good about saying if you invest this much, this is what you're going to save in the long run. And the reason the federal government is willing to invest $370 million over the next five years is not because they are nice people. And it's not even really because they think that it's going to get PBIS in place. It's because they think that investment is going to save them a whole lot more down the road. We've got to be able to show those, those data. You as a group need to leave today with a common vision and a common language that you can use. I want you to have the discussions inside San Francisco that, that make this relevant for you. But it's really important. I want you to be fluent at being able to communicate with this stuff. So I'm actually going to give you some tasks as we go along. But let's be clear. The primary thing we're focused on, the fundamental purpose of PBIS is to create more efficient and equitable learning environments. So we hold ourselves accountable to the extent to which all kids are being able to be successful. We hold ourselves accountable for the extent to which math and reading scores go up. We hold ourselves accountable for the extent to which kids are engaged. And Hetty is here and is going to be giving us additional assistance related to attendance. But attendance is really only one metric of the larger construct of engagement. Basically, you're not going to get kids being successful in school unless they are physically there, they are mentally and socially engaged in what's going on. And we've got to create an environment where they not just show up, but they're actually excited to be there and they're paying attention. So I want you to say, how are we going to do that? If you were to condense the last 40 years of research in terms of what are the fundamental things we know, I want you to create a school where kids show up, kids pay attention, they interact successfully with each other, and they're successful both socially and academically. Got it? What would you create? What are the critical features of that environment? And socially, here's what I think they are. One, the environment is excruciatingly predictable. You walk into the environment and you know what the expectations are. Now, come on, those of you who work in middle schools and high schools, you know that kids of color, kids from low income, kids from different cultures, kids from different languages, they walk in, they don't feel this is my school. They're, they're confused about what the expectations are. You've got kids who come from social environments that just break your heart, all right? They come from highly traumatic situations. Those kids come both physiologically and psychologically not ready to learn. You've got to bend over backwards. I want you to create something where when you walk into school, I want them to be the classic adolescent overconfident, I know how to do this, right? I mean, the really the whole thing about adolescence is this, this sense of, I think I got it worked out, even though they don't have a clue.